Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, the podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Welcome back to Plain Spoken. I'm Derek Fournier, your host from Plain Sight Strategy Group, and I'm coming to you from lovely Belgium, actually Antwerp. I'm actually on client site this week and enjoying uh, my first trip abroad in quite some time. Uh, when I travel abroad, I tend to do a lot of walking and a lot of sightseeing and take a lot of pictures. And as you can imagine here in Antwerp, there are tons of great things to look at. But today's episode, this is the sixth in a series that I did as a sort of accountability process to make sure that I was producing podcast content on a regular cadence is about leading with empathy. Uh, we had a blog post earlier this week to sort of tease that that concept. And today is going to be all about leading with empathy and some pieces and parts that I think are critical to pay attention to when you're doing so. I want to make sure that I'm clear. Uh, I have not always led with empathy. <laughs> and in fact, some would say I still don't. And, and it's not one of those things where it's a, a binary bit you flip where all of a sudden you're an empathetic leader and therefore you just are empathetic all the time. We are human animals. We do have moods. Uh, situations do change. But one of the things, you know, my, my brother, the deacon, says uh, time can either be a tutor or a tyrant. And one of the things I hope I have learned in my decades on this rock that we call Earth is some kind of empathy. And so as we talk about leading with empathy today, empathy today, I want to emphasize how important it is and, and go over a couple of the key aspects that you can do to keep an eye on it, some techniques and some examples where I have seen it work really, really well. Uh, some of them are anecdotal. I wasn't present when they happened, but they certainly have become sort of part of the ecosystem and we hear about them. But most of them are going to be very, very direct. And as I go through this topic on the on the video on YouTube or also on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you either on Twitter. We do have a Twitter handle at Plainsight GRP, or you can tweet me directly at Derek Fournier. Uh, I'd love to hear how you look at leadership, how empathy factors into the way you lead, or how your leaders lead you and whether you see that sort of empathy in what you do day to day. But as we've done recently, we're going to add the slides here. So the folks that are listening to the audio, you don't have the benefit of the video, but you can always go to our YouTube channel to check that out. Uh, the first aspect of leading with empathy is encouraging open communication. Open communication sounds like one of those things that's just super easy to do. Of course, we have to be open. Everyone wants open communication until someone tells them they're full of shit, uh, especially if that someone is not the boss right? You, you take it when it's the boss, or at least we've been trained to. And and what I'd like to try and get through here is, and it's funny, I was with a, a client this week, and I have this weird sort of trigger on tops, mids, bottoms with regards to organizational leadership. And I bristle all the time because I really envision a, a, a more flat hierarchy in, in healthy organizations. And I think probably one of the reasons I do is because I want open dialogue. I don't want the strata of a hierarchy to stifle meaningful feedback. And so you're going to see some words in here that feel soft to me because of the generation that I came up in. And I mentioned that in the blog uh, that we wrote about this week. But the concept of a safe environment or a safe space to share ideas is critical. What you call it, whatever you want to call it to make yourself feel better about it is fine. I don't really care. But you've got to encourage feedback. You've got to make your people understand that they're there for a reason. We are not replacing uh, machines with people hoping to get a flesh-built machine. If you're in that business, this is a different conversation. You probably should go back to machines. If you're using human folk, human animals, 
then we want them for the whole total person that they are. We want their insights. We want their perspective. We want their dialogue and their feedback. Now, all of that has to be done with an eye towards goals and focus and not randomizing it. And that requires structure. But in order to get anywhere down this road, you have got to create, foster, reinforce, and live an environment that encourages open communication. When you do that, you're going to have collaboration in all directions across your, across your company. You're going to have better and more efficient problem solving. You're going to have less siloing. You should, in fact, have less infighting, right? Because folks are going to be more direct with their communication. They're going to be more open and honest. There's going to be less holding back. And then, oh, well, I told you that wasn't going to work. This is something we want to try and get out of the organization. And it all starts with this concept of open communication, not being lip service, but being genuine. And it, and it really has to come from the leadership all the way through the entire organization and be almost cheer-led so that people know that they can, they can participate in that process. Along with open communication, uh, there's a necessary piece of blocking and tackling called active listening. And it's funny because for years, I probably was really crappy at this, uh, I used to listen to respond, and that's certainly a way. <laughs> Uh, I would assert it is not the best way to listen. When you're listening to someone, you need to actually pay attention to the speaker. Now, I missed that class, apparently, in school when I was coming up. And I also missed the one that says you need to show genuine interest in the conversation. Uh, when I have a tendency to get into what I call hyper-processing, and I think I already know the answer to the question, it's almost like I'm looking for the fast-forward button on the remote control when people talk. I say that as a cautionary tale because you should never do that, right? I do it from time to time, and I've, I've gotten much better at catching myself, I think. I'm sure I screw it up more often than I should. But when we're listening, we have to make sure that we are actually processing the information coming in, not in order to structure our response, but in order to capture the feedback, right? In order to inspire that open communication, we have to actually live it. And the easiest way to do that, in my experience, is to practice this active listening. That's going to do a couple of things. A, it's going to get you more information. B, it's going to really set the seeds in place for open communication when people see you actively listening and participating. And there are some tools you can use to do this, right? You can you can parrot the, the statements back. You can uh, echo. There's a bunch of different words they use for them, but make sure that the person presenting you with data understands that you are processing everything they say. You're listening, you're hearing it, and you're, you're actually comprehending it. It always reminds me of the funny uh, line from White Men Can't Jump, the original. I don't know if they redid it in the remake um, where <laughs> Woody Harrelson couldn't uh, hear Jimmy. He could listen to Jimmy Hendrix, but he couldn't hear it. Sometimes managers can't hear what their people are saying. They're, they're listening, but they can't hear it because they're not actively listening to what people say. So if you can get to that part, you can really get the information that the people are trying to give you. And that is part of the uh, secret to showing empathy, because that's the third part that that active listening will do. And you don't realize it, it almost comes along for the ride. But when you're spending that much effort to listen to your people, there is going to be an emotional connection made. They're going to feel valued because it's not just sort of, I've got to just, I've got to listen because you're here. You're present. I have to pretend that I'm listening. You're actually engaged. You're actually taking their feedback. Now, this one is tough. Understanding different perspectives. And the, the typical experiment, and I just saw it done last week, is you've probably seen the meme. If I were better at this podcast production uh, video side, I'd put an, a meme up with the number six uh, on the floor. One person looking at it looks like six. The other person looking at it looks like nine. That's a really easy way to kind of talk about perspective. But one of the things that I have noticed is by keeping your, your mind open to the lens through which the people you're communicating with see the world and not just listening to the words they say, but listening from the place that they come from, you're going to broaden and enrich the feedback that you're getting. This one is hard. Um, 
you know, Satya Nadella, when he came back to Microsoft, sort of tried to bring this concept back. There's a lot of empathy that Satya brought in. If we think back to leaders that we've worked with, the ones who we connected with, I think, always showed true value in where their people came from. And when I say that, I don't mean the country they came from or the city they came from. I don't mean literal things like that. But but sometimes that's informative. Um, one of the things, the chips that I've always worn on my shoulder is that I grew up economically poor as uh, per standards in the United States, which are obviously different than standards across the world. And so every room that I walked into, I had a chip on my shoulder because I felt that I had come from less. And so there was a little bit of a biting aspect to my communication. I really needed to kind of get that under control. It, it fed something that many of us face, which is you know what's called the imposter syndrome. We feel as though we don't belong in those rooms. And when we feel that way, we're not giving our best self. We've got our shields up. So we can't, we can't participate to the level that we need to. And so as I fight that in myself, I would encourage anyone out there listening to, to reflect on how you communicate with people, whether you're the top or whether you're the bottom, whether you're the, and I know someone's going to make fun of that, uh, that vernacular and feel free to do so. But whether you're the leader or the follower, wherever you are in this participation, always take stock in the perspective from which the information is being delivered. And that's true, whether it's just a, a send and a receive where there are two people communicating or whether you're working on messaging that will go to a third party or to a customer base, make sure that you're taking time to consider the perspectives and the lenses through which your customers, clients, recipients of the message are going to consume the content. If you don't do that, I promise you, you're going to miss. Now, there are obvious misses that are painful when you, when you screw it up so bad you offend people. But I would assert that those are easier to catch than just being blind to how ignorant you may be because you didn't take the time necessary to even investigate what the perspective was of the person you were speaking with. And as we talk about this as one of the building blocks for empathy, taking that time and investigating, getting to know people, getting to know whether it's people you work with, that should be almost table stakes. We should all get to know the people we work with. We spend, hell, almost as much time with them as we do with our significant others if we happen to have one. So take the time, get to know what drives people, get to know what motivates them, get to know what they love, what they hate. That doesn't mean you're going to be their best friend. It doesn't mean that they're going to ask you to be their best man or, or maid of honor in their wedding, but it does mean you have some sort of sense of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, what will drive them and what won't, what will what will attract them to an idea, what will attract their participation and what won't. And if you can get that concept down with the people for whom you are the closest, then I would assert it's a little bit easier when you start looking to the people that are a couple of degrees away. Uh, when we When we were shipping software back in Microsoft, one of the things that was absent early was perspective of the user. There were a bunch of really smart people who wanted to make people's lives better and they thought through technology they could do that. And that dream is a great dream. It's an aspirational goal. But they didn't know why the people's lives sucked. They had textbook definitions of them. They had two-dimensional representations of what the world looked like to the very customers they were trying to support. None of them had sat in the chair of the customers they were trying to enrich the lives of. Now, I get it. You can't come go out there and be everyone you're trying to, to service. But you can spend an appropriate amount of time getting to know people, getting to know your target market, getting to know your customer, getting to know your colleague, getting to know your coworker, getting to know your teammate, so that you can better structure your communication because you understand those different perspectives. Now, I know it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse here, but I got to tell you, this is probably one of the toughest ones on this list. And it is absolutely going to be at the heart of creating a truly visceral connection of empathy. You won't always get there. There are going to be some perspectives you just won't get. You'll never be able to understand what it's like to be, insert topic here, demographic, whatever you want to use it as. But I promise you, if you really try, you will earn a tremendous amount of respect and you'll at least get somewhere down the road towards understanding it. And that's going to make all of the communication that is a result of that connection much, much better.
The next piece is supporting employee well-being. Now, this one would have been obvious, and it probably seems obvious. It almost stands out in that it's not, well, I guess it is tactical, but this one can come across as incredibly soft, I think, and I don't want it to. As a leader, you're always going to have policies and procedures that are critical. Things that you do with regards to sick time and vacation time and and work hours. And, and now the hot topic is work from home or don't work from home. I just saw, I think it was maybe Amazon. I don't know. Apologies if that's wrong. Someone just said, all right, the hell with what you're doing. Come to work. The reality that I think COVID urged on or spurred was that we can do a lot even when we're not together. What I think we seem to like as humans is we like an answer. We like binary choices. We, we like a final decision. Either I work in the office or I work from home. And what I think is becoming the case, and, and I talk about flexible work schedules on the slide, um, but I'll talk about some other pieces, but this one is, is top of mind because it is top of mind in our culture. My, my counsel to you, though you did not request it, is when you're looking at how people work in your organization, optimize for getting the best out of them and the people they work with. And yes, sometimes that's going to be expensive. It's an ROI discussion. Are you getting more benefit by doing it? You know, I've had conversations with people all the time. I've worked remote for the better part of 25 years in some form or fashion. When COVID came along and everyone went remote and, you know, the proliferation of Zoom and the ubiquitous nature of Internet connections in the United States, all of a sudden people thought, well, I don't ever have to go in the office again. I can do everything through this two-dimensional pane of glass. It is my belief that that is not true. Can you do it? Yes. Can you effectively run things? Yes. You can make things work. You can make progress. It's better than email for sure. With video, it's better than a phone call. Nothing replaces co-location. Nothing replaces a literal water cooler, right? Not a virtual water cooler, not a team's meeting water cooler, but a real water cooler where we hang around and we talk about the sports teams that we love and that we hate, or we talk about how our kids didn't listen or how our dog took a dump on the, on the living room floor. These are things that are... <clears throat> They don't show up in an MBA curriculum on how to build rapport and connection with our teammates. But they are, in my opinion, inarguably human and things we've got to do. And so as a leader of a company that is distributed, you've got to figure out how is it that you can engage those things? How is it that you can encourage those things? It's really hard for distributed organizations to do this because it gets very expensive very quickly. And when it comes down to efficient use of capital, no, we don't want to go buy corporate space everywhere in every city we happen to operate in. So we end up doing travel and we end up getting together in clusters. You've just got to do the best you can do. Now, underneath this, I'm going to cover the other two bullets on the slide. I want to go back to the concept of flexible work schedules. Mental health has become a topic and it's about damn time. For so long, my generation was certainly guilty of this. In the blog post I've, I wrote, you know, rub some dirt in it. You know, uh, what the hell was it? I, I used to tell my mom, get over it, right? The Eagles had just come out with an album. And, and I didn't understand why people brought their emotions to work. Because I was 20. I didn't even understand my own emotions at that point. We do bring our emotions to work. We bring them everywhere. We can't separate from them most of the times. So mental health resources are critical. Now, whether we think today is more screwed up than 20 years ago or than it will be from 20 years from now, it doesn't matter. As an organization, providing the resources necessary both for people's physical health and their mental health is critical. And simple things like mental health days, just letting people know that some days we get it, you don't feel like you can do it today. Take the day off. Don't cough when you call. Don't make up an excuse. Don't do any of that shit. Just be honest, because remember, we've talked about trust before, and if you start chipping away at the trust value through dumb things like unnecessary lies about the fact that, you know what, today is just not the day I'm going to bring my best to the game, then what the hell have you done? 
So be open to those things. Yes, I'll put a little asterisk here. There are size companies that you have to have rules and regulations and someone's going to get sued. And yes, that's a whole sidetrack for the litigious nature of business in the U.S. I can't speak to business abroad. But I do try to err on the side of do the thing that makes sense, that matters, and that benefits people the most. And being flexible with how they work and taking care of their mental health by providing benefits and time. Sometimes all you can do is provide time and space, right? You, it's, it's not a recipe. I can't just add some paprika to it and magically it goes away. But I can provide time and space and maybe benefits that they can leverage to go take action that's appropriate. I can add my understanding, my compassion, my empathy. The last button, uh, bullet on here is about work-life balance. And I know people are sick and talking about work-life balance. And now there's a sort of the typical pendulum-like swing back with, you know, founder-led companies and, and yes, grind, grind, grind. You know what? Just please stop with the binary approaches. I get it. Contrarian is fun and it drives attention span on a, in a micro universe where 140 characters is what we call attention span now. Do what works. Some people really, really love to work all the time. If they really, really love to work all the time, making them go home is not servicing them. But they have to feel comfortable telling you whether that's true or not. It always goes back to trust. It always goes back to open communication. All of those primary bricks in the foundation of your relationship that structure of business is built upon are critical so that you can get to what work-life balance really means. You can provide people the freedom they, they need to do those things, whether it's spend time at their kids' baseball games, God forbid they play baseball, or like me. I remember a time when I was working with a client and they had a big uh, go live on a voyage and it was over Halloween. And I'm like, sorry, I don't miss Halloween with my kids. They were both young. Halloween's a big holiday for us. I just don't travel. They weren't particularly happy about it. I didn't particularly care. That's That was a no fly for me. Everyone's got their own things. Understand what they are and use that to build rapport, connection, and a relationship with the people who are helping you build your, your organization. That is what I mean when I say support well-being. Now, there's all sorts of other stuff you could put in here uh, around you know health plans and all that other stuff, and that, that's all good. But when it comes to empathy, these are the, the key pieces that, that I'm really focusing on in this uh, episode. And the last one, which is probably the most painful for me, which is funny, if you can see the slide now, it says leading by example. Um, when it comes to empathetic leadership, if you did all of the other slides really, really well, that's awesome. You've taken huge steps, in my opinion, towards building an environment within which empathetic leadership is demonstrated and leveraged. As I've mentioned, that's all built on strong, trust-based relationships and a true active listening environment with open dialogue. But if you don't live it yourself, you undermine everything because what you're saying, what's coming out of your mouth is not how you're acting. Now, I don't mean how you act towards other people here. That's an easy one, right? You got to walk the walk if you talk the talk. But the chapter, and, I, and I've mentioned this on previous podcasts, but it, it bears repeating here as the last topic on empathetic leadership. The best example, the most obvious example is, you know, if you're trying to make sure people get home, let's say you're working together, you're co-located, you go to an office, a sort of traditional model. And you say, hey, guys, everyone, team, don't stay out. Don't stay late, right? Go home, see your family, have dinner with the family. We, we have a, a company plan or company culture says, Get out of here by 5.30, whatever it is, 5 o'clock. I don't care. Pick a number, right? But if you're always there till 9, what do you think that makes your employees feel like? Now, certainly, there was a time in my life where I said, well, it makes them feel like the person who runs the company is working really hard to try and make us successful. That's one takeaway. The one that hit me was, when you tell people to log off and spend time with their family and yet you respond to email at two and three in the morning. Now, I know that some of us are driven by this. And if that's true, then you're in a tough spot 
because you've got to find a way where you can live your real life, the thing that drives your passion, in a way that doesn't inadvertently make others feel less. When I say feel less, I mean feel less committed, less dedicated, less involved, less serious. I know that's not the intent, or it, it's not the intent for most. What the intent is, is to do the most. Do all you can, especially if you're a founder or you know a, a leader in a small organization. You're just trying to carry as much water as possible. And, and hell, maybe because you're doing it this week and you'll need time next week, someone else will. And that is something that we always live by. Right? Sometimes everyone's got to grab a shovel. But if it's always happening, you've got to make sure that your actions live your values, demonstrate your values. And sometimes you got to get creative about it, right? And there are tons of tools to do that, but just be cognizant of it so that you don't accidentally undermine all of the great work you've done in putting together the other foundational elements to leading with empathy. So those are the topics for leading with empathy. Um, hopefully you guys found some value in that. I'd love to hear your stories of leaders you've worked with who you feel demonstrate leading with empathy. Um, uh, all those stories are really, really useful. I've been very fortunate in my life. I've had some great leaders that I've worked with who I knew cared about me, who I'm still friends with. That's why when I look at the people I communicate with now, they're people I've known for 10, 20, 30 years. But because I've done that for 10, 20, 30 years, for me to build new relationships like that, I bring forth all of the experience from the previous ones, the stuff that worked, the stuff that didn't work, and all of those kind of basic blocking and tackling pieces that we talked about around effective listening, active listening, open communications, care for well-being, view of different perspectives. Those pieces just become very natural. They become traits of your standard communication, and it will inspire and instill you to be an empathetic leader, whether you're a leader of just yourself, your small work group, your larger department, or an entire company. So uh, I want to thank you for joining Plain Spoken today, being recorded here in Antwerp, Belgium. Uh, if you want to engage with us, you know how to do that. We're in LinkedIn more often than anything else, but we do uh, tweet on Twitter or X, whatever we're supposed to call it, at Derek Fournier or at Plain Sight GRP. If you start engaging that way, we'll engage with you, as well as uh, you know, comments on, on LinkedIn are always great. And with the next set of uh, topics, we're going to try and get some feedback from you guys to figure out what it'll be, but it'll be in about two weeks. And if we can ever help you guys, you know, we think about effective leadership and the other topics we talk about, building trust, strong communications, all of those uh, customer-centric viewpoints, dynamic experience. These are things that Plain Sight Group focuses on. And it's not just me. I'm the one who's got my big mug on the, the video and my voice on the podcast and do a lot of the writing. But I've got a team of professionals that I've worked with over the years who are just as dedicated to this stuff as I am. Just as much a geek as I am about these things, they are. They just don't have the, the wherewithal or the vanity or whatever the hell it is to get out here and do this stuff. But we can absolutely help you if you're facing a struggle within your organization. So reach out to us. Go to the website. Uh, the tag will be in the uh, bumper here at the end. And reach out, contact us, and we'll see if we can help you with your next project. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show and found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then... Keep growing. What the, 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 what the